Hi, welcome to the webinar of the Vocational Rehabilitation Technical Assistance Center for Targeted Communities. This webinar's primary focus is to give an overview of the four phases of intensive technical assistance provided by the project to 12 states and 24 targeted communities. I am Madan Kundu, and I have the distinct privilege and honor of serving this five-year project as a project director. In this webinar, I, along with my colleagues, will provide an overview of the intensive technical assistance and its impact on the project in state vocational rehabilitation agencies and community rehabilitation programs and community-based organizations since 2015. My colleagues are Susan Flowers, principal investigator, and Mr. John Walls, project manager. This National Technical Assistance Center is a unique and innovative initiative of the Rehabilitation Services Administration, United States Department of Education. This presentation is made possible with support from the Rehabilitation Services Administration, US Department of Education. The ideas and opinions we express in this presentation are those of the presenters and do not represent recommendation, endorsement, and policies of the US Department of Education. We want to express our sincere appreciation to Mr. Felipe Luli, our project officer of RSA, for his guidance in implementing this project and achievements to date. This project has significantly impacted people with disabilities in the country, especially for the most vulnerable people with disabilities who are economically disadvantaged and live in rural and remote locations. We owe our gratitude to one who had the sensitivity and vision to respond to the request for proposal for the Vocational Rehabilitation Technical Assistance Center for targeted communities. As chair of the department, Dr. Alodata approached me about writing this proposal. I said, no, as we do not have enough faculty to handle this national project. She replied, we know that. She already figured out and said, we will have partner universities to help implement this project around the country. We consulted Dr. Fong Chen of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and added five partners to the proposal. Given the short time and approaching deadline, that Dr. Data toiled every day for a month until the wee hours of the morning so that Dr. Chen and I can provide feedback the next morning for further improvement of the proposal. We received the grant, but now we have to develop two targeted communities proposal for each state by each partner for 12 states, a total of 24 proposal, it was a very arduous task rather than receiving the grant. So Dr. Data's vision for the project is to improve the quality of services to unserved and underserved economically disadvantaged people with disabilities by educating, empowering, and employing them in remunerative occupations and thereby improve the quality of life. The project's name was a mouthful, Vocational Rehabilitation Technical Assistance Center for Targeted Communities. Therefore, Dr. Data succinctly described the initiative's three primary focuses and coined the term Project E3, Educate, Empower, and Employ. The first is to educate the state vocational rehabilitation agency's personnel and their partners community rehabilitation programs and community-based organizations. The second is to employ the underserved and unserved consumers with the knowledge to increase participation so that they can take advantage of the available vocational rehabilitation services. And third is to employ these consumers in competitive integrated employment, supported employment, or self-employment to enhance the quality of life and become taxpayer than tax consumers. So this presentation 
will discuss the ways her vision and project objectives have been achieved. Let us allow me to say a few words about her dedication to the field of rehabilitation. She was an excellent teacher and taught research and statistics. She used to hold extra classes on Fridays for those who need help in statistics and research methodology. She was student focused. We wrote training grants to receive scholarships that will allow our economically disadvantaged students to study and earn a degree and to move ahead in their lives. Dr. Datta was a team player and we collaborated in writing grants, research and publications. Uh, she was the principal investigator and project director of 11 training, research and capacity building and technical assistance center grants. She was the co-PI and associate project director of nine other grants. So we secured funding of $31 million. She was a guest reviewer of 10 journals, published 50 reference journal articles and made 80 presentations. And she received 14 awards and recognition. You can see her dedication for the film. But she was a quiet, smart, creative, diligent, productive, reliable, and dedicated. She was my student and a colleague. I'm blessed that I had the opportunity to work with her. Dr. Data will have a special place in our students' and colleagues' hearts as she has touched, touched many lives. Recognizing her contribution and dedication in rehabilitation, the National Council on Rehabilitation Education has established the Dr. Aladatta Memorial Scholarship Fund. The scholarship annually recognizes an outstanding doctoral dissertation in the country. Last week, Dr. Data has, was recognized by the National Association of Rehabilitation Research and Technical Assistance Center posthumously with a commendation award for her contribution to rehabilitation. We pray that her, re her soul rests in peace with the Almighty. The project E3, the Southern University is the prime receiver of the grant and we have five university partners. They are University of Wisconsin Medicine, the University of Wisconsin at Stout, the George Washington University, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, University of Kentucky, and one advocacy organization, Council of State Administrators for Vocational Rehabilitation. Now I request Mr. John Walls to make his presentation. The purpose of Project D3 was to provide technical assistance to state VR agencies and their partners to address barriers to VR participation and to increase competitive integrated employment of historically underserved groups of individuals with disabilities. Intensive technical assistance was provided by the partners of the E3 team on site through long term service delivery relationships with the local state VR agency personnel and community-based organizations in economically disadvantaged communities identified by the VR agencies themselves. In addition, targeted and universal TA was also provided to the broad VR community in order to promote the objectives of the project. For the purpose of this project, a targeted community is defined as any economically disadvantaged community that would qualify as an empowerment zone. And in order for that community to qualify under that classification, the median household income would have to be under 200% of the federal poverty level. That unemployment rate is or at above the national average. And based on the results of the comprehensive statewide needs assessment within a particular state, there would have to be an indication that a group of individuals receiving services from VR have been traditionally underserved in those particular settings. In addition, Project E3 also looked at focus populations or high leverage groups with national applicability. These are groups of individuals with disability who has frequently identified by the state VR agency as being either underserved or as achieving substandard performance. 
So some of the examples of these high leverage groups include residents of rural and remote communities, adults and youth that were affiliated with the criminal justice system, individuals with disabilities in foster care. In addition, individuals with disabilities receiving federal financial assistance, including SSI or SSDI recipients. In addition, there was also focus on populations uh, addressing persons with multiple disabilities or people living with specific conditions such as HIV AIDS, mental illness, cognitive disabilities, or sensory disabilities. Project D3 provided intensive technical assistance to 24 targeted communities in 12 states across the country. In today's presentation, we're going to highlight eight of those states, California, Kentucky, Oregon, Louisiana, New Jersey, New Mexico, North Carolina, and Virginia, that in their own words will present information about the projects within their states. Project E3 was originally conceptualized as a series of four phases with each phase building on the lessons learned and the insights gained from the previous. The first phase was community outreach and orientation for target populations. This phase focused on increasing the number of VR referrals and applications from HLGNA groups in the targeted communities. Engaging the community was the overarching goal of the entire project. During the second phase, community needs assessment and strategies for change, E3 partners worked with community stakeholders to identify barriers to VR participation and employment in each targeted community with the goal of working together to then develop strategies to address those barriers, which then informed the work of the third phase, training and technical assistance for staffs of VR agencies, community rehabilitation programs, and community-based organizations. In this phase, Project E3 partners began to offer trainings and technical assistance aimed at addressing some of those gaps that were identified by ongoing community needs assessments. Trainings were offered on specific topics geared towards bridging those knowledge and skill gaps to improve the capacity of rehabilitation professionals to provide those VR services and comprehensive supports, while at the same time expand employment opportunities for members of their prioritized communities. And as we wrap up the project, we've now turned our focus to sustaining the work that was begun in the previous three phases. In this final phase, sustainability and systems change, Project E3 partners focused on further developing and strengthening those collaborative relationships, both with and between community stakeholders and focused populations to address barriers to access and participation in VR services, especially those that affect a person's ability to obtain and remain employed but might be considered outside of the scope of VR services. This fourth phase, sustainability, is the focus of our presentation today. In this presentation, we'll highlight vignettes of our state VR partners discussing the Project E3 activities that they plan to continue and the steps that they intend to take to continue those activities. As we go more in depth through the phases, we'll highlight the examples of how these states plan to sustain some of those ITA activities aligning with each phase. The primary focus of phase one was to increase the number of VR referrals and applications from HLGNA groups in the targeted communities. This was achieved through outreach to community-based organizations, otherwise known as CBOs, as well as potentially eligible individual from the groups that were identified as needing more services. This two-pronged approach served to both increase the awareness of VR services in these communities and to increase the CBO's capacity to identify and refer potentially eligible individuals. For example, outreach efforts to CBOs led to meetings and increased collaboration between VR and community agency professionals. Project E3 partners report that these meetings initiated as part of the program of community outreach served to develop or improve existing relationships which led to an increase in referrals to VR, as well as increasing counselor knowledge of available community resources. Additionally, one partner developed a referral screening tool, which was for use in Chicago TC, and is also available for use as appropriate in other communities. Uh, outreach 
efforts specifically to individuals included outreach and orientation sessions that address the general lack of awareness of VR services and procedures, as well as issues specific to that community, such as lack of trust. All outreach activities in each TC were adapted to fit community needs. And so some of these examples include public service announcements that were specifically tailored to reach prioritized populations, and other types of targeted outreach, such as community forums, listening sessions, social media posts, radio interviews, as well as videos, podcasts, and literature distribution. And all of these were done in accessible formats. California is one of the project partners that came up with a creative and robust outreach solution for the communities that they wanted to better serve. In California, the targeted community was California's Central Valley region with a replication site in Fresno and Kern counties. California's focus population included young Hispanic adults with chronic illness or disability receiving public assistance and young Hmong adults with depression or PTSD receiving public assistance. In this vignette, Project D3 partners discussed their goals for sustaining Project Out3 outreach initiatives, which includes their outreach to the Hmong population. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, presenting for you today is California, and we are going to be presenting regarding our continuation and sustainability plan for Project E3. Uh, my name is Priscilla Varela and I am the Regional Business Specialist for the San Joaquin Valley District. Uh, we also have Devin Puente, who is our Qualified Rehabilitation Counselor, and our Regional Director, Araceli Holland, today. Hello everyone, my name is Devin Puente. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in uh, a project that was uh, in correlation with E3. Um, based on community uh, radio stations. We were able to get connected with a local community radio station um, to focus on the Hmong population, which is an un underserved and unserved population in our area. And because of this, we were able to increase our number of referrals for Hmong individuals. We would like this whole idea and concept to be expanded throughout the state of California in order to target more unserved and underserved populations, leveraging community-based radio stations. These radio stations would help us to, to uh, show an approach, a different type of approach in order to educate and encourage community members to seek out resources they wouldn't ordinarily know about. Hello everybody, this is Priscilla. Um, in California, we would also like to see an expansion and continuation of community focused marketing materials and staff training. We believe that an expansion of the community focused marketing materials would allow for us to reach our targeted population in other areas and would assure we further sustain the E3 project. Through the marketing materials, partnerships were created to establish a more unified way of providing services to unserved and underserved populations. Uh, we would also like to see a continuation and expansion of resources and trainings for staff and community partners. Um, some trainings that were provided in the San Joaquin Valley District in California were motivational interviewing, trauma-informed training, and money management. Uh, the marketing materials allowed for us to make connections which resulted in resources and trainings and um, some local trainings which were fundamental and provided. Um, while the trainings assured that our staff and community partners had the tools and resources that they needed. Another concept that we barely were able to touch on um, so far is the integrative resource team. Um, we had a very short meeting with some representatives of this uh, idea at the last um, community of practice training uh, in New Orleans. And we would like to receive further comprehensive training on this uh, idea and would like it to be integrated and expanded, not only within our local district, but throughout the state in order for us to provide better services to our consumers. Uh, we would like to see a continuation and expansion of the IRT within our district to better provide uh, customer service to our targeted populations. 
Um, and we would also like to see a continuation of the IRT to support the teens. Um, we hope to see this rolled out in our district and hopefully throughout the state of California. Hi, uh, my name is Araceli Holland. I am the Regional Director for the San Joaquin Valley District uh, in the Department of Rehab in California. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about our California Sustainability Plan and our next steps. Um, we are hoping in an effort to, to uh, build on our sustainability plan is to provide a presentation to our executive leadership. Uh, we want to be able to provide them with a presentation of the E3 project, the services that we provided and the outcomes in order to buy to get some buy-in. Uh, we already work, we have already uh, been able to acquire a dedicated person uh, for our IRT team. Uh, and we hope to be building an IRT uh, team model around that individual. We also have a work group uh, that we've established to expand the E3 pilots best practices statewide. Um, is as part of that, we've also recognized that we need to provide some training and we would like to expand as well on the IRT training for our current staff. And we are going to be dedicating some training funds to be able to provide that training. Uh, we're also developing a demographic data project because we understand from the E3 project that we really do have to be data driven in order to develop good practices. We need to know who our community is. Uh, we need to know who the people we are serving are, and most importantly, the people that we are not serving. And we hope that uh, by understanding our local communities, we can better build our program to meet their needs. Uh, another practice that really helped us through the E3 project is the local advisory board. Um, so we're hoping to replicate that. We are already starting our second local advisory board uh, in the southern part of our district but we are also going to introduce it as part of the statewide uh, best practices from E3 and hope to be able to use that as a model concept for all of the Department of Rehabilitation regions. We are looking at ways of securing funding for ongoing training for the E3 project. We have some potential uh, of being able to continue providing training in the motivational counseling, the trauma-informed, uh, and the money management, but also in being able to train additional staff on the integrated resource team model. So we are looking forward uh, to implementing the things that we have learned from the E3 project. We are, um, we are developing a very positive uh, and we're happy to have a path forward in developing our sustainable plan uh, moving forwards with our E3 project. So, I want to thank you guys all for your time and um, look forward to sharing more information. Community-based participatory research is a well-known research approach that emphasizes the importance of engagement and collaboration between researchers and for the community from whom the research or program is ultimately meant to serve. Project E3 used elements of CVPR at all phases of the project. E3 partners worked in collaboration with community stakeholders to identify their needs and identify and implement the most appropriate strategies to address those needs. Project E3 partners enlisted the help of local community experts to identify the needs of the focus communities. This was primarily done through hosting focus groups and listening sessions, as well as convening advisory councils. Though each state and community identified different needs, there were some specific areas of overlap. Um, the first one was a general kind of awareness, lack of awareness of VR services. And then two, a lack of relationship between community-based organizations and VR. And then three, there were many external barriers such as transportation, a lack of employment opportunities in the area and other specific issues relevant to that particular community. New Jersey, Kentucky and Oregon projects are all excellent examples of the ways that E3 partners and community stakeholders were able to come together to focus on the identification of barriers to access and provision of services and begin to find solutions. The city of Newark was the targeted community in New Jersey, and the prioritized populations included people receiving SSI or SSDI 
who have also been diagnosed with mental illness or a substance use disorder. In this vignette, Project E3 partners discuss how they were able to build on and expand an existing disability issues committee to increase community partnerships, resulting in increased participation in the public workforce development system. Welcome, uh, my name is John Walsh and I'm project manager for Project E3. I'm here with Rebecca Schulman and Elaine Katz from our New Jersey project. We wanted to talk a little bit about the project in New Jersey and what are some of the next steps. So Rebecca and Elaine, I'm gonna turn it over to both of you. Thank you, John. Great, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, basically, um, the purpose of our presentation is to discuss a little bit about what we've been doing in New Jersey. Um, I, as chair, co-chair of our Disability Issues Subcommittee of the Workforce Development Board, uh, one of the most positive outcomes that we saw was expanding the efforts of our committee to include additional members uh, who, had no, who had not before participated and also to expand community partnerships and outreach. That was our first priority. In terms of what we have done and what we wanna see continued, we're going to be working on cross-training opportunities between partners in the workforce development system. And one of the really positive um, results is that we brought together members of public and private partners in order to help extend our reach. Um, what we also saw was increased employment participation rates for individuals with disabilities in the public workforce system uh, and in community-based organizations. We had individuals, particularly in the public workforce system, who had very limited, if any, um, connection with working with individuals who have disabilities. And by participating and going through the training that was provided, they really learned a great deal about the types of services that individuals with disabilities can use and how much of, this, much of these services are available in the public workforce system. We also did a lot of cross training that was helpful to increase awareness around serving the individuals with disabilities that um, hopefully will be positively impacted by this program. So in terms of sustainability, we do plan to put together a community academy once we're able to go in person again right now. Um, many of the agencies are providing virtual services. So we are looking forward to uh, being able to host a community academy. And we're also looking for other opportunities to engage with training and technical assistance the Disability Issues Committee will be continuing, and um, it is hoped that we will be able to look at additional opportunities as a result of our regular committee meetings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I would just like to add that we really want to thank the Project E3 team for coming to New Jersey. I think there was a lot of resource information and as Becky mentioned, the continuing education, that was really helpful for both public workforce and um, then the uh, community of practice on the ground as well. And I think we all learned a lot. I think it was uh, difficult the past six months because of COVID where we couldn't finish off the project um, and have the, vert um, you know, the engagement we really wanted. But again, we're really happy that we are a part of the project and we look forward to um, perhaps being part of another project in the near future. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Elaine. Yes, Thank you absolutely. so much, Elaine and Rebecca, for that great presentation on New Jersey. Kentucky and Oregon were parallel projects, both focused on transition age youth and young adults in rural or remote communities. In Kentucky, the prioritized populations included transition age youth with developmental disabilities or young adults with mental health diagnosis in rural and remote communities. In Oregon, the focus populations included transition age youth and adults with sensory disabilities residing in Bend or Medford, Oregon. In both areas, transportation was a significant barrier to employment for people with disabilities. In this vignette, E3 partners in Oregon and Kentucky discussed solutions identified assessing 
community needs and brainstorming solutions for transportation. Hi, I'm Jane Hagel, and I'm a voc rehab counselor in Southern Oregon. I've been working with the ETHI project for five years, and now we're, we're proceeding on to sustainability. Hi, I'm Roxana Robinson. I'm a regional manager for the Kentucky Vocational Rehabilitation, and I've been working with the project E3 for about a year. So Kentucky and Oregon have been parallel projects, both working with VR in rural and remote areas through the University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute. As a result, we've shared priorities and we'll be reporting those and our sustainability together. Although the COVID-19 pandemic has created a definite barrier of PPDs and social distancing, the telephone has recently developed into more of a social contact tool for developing relationships since face-to-face -face interactions are more problematic. Starting with the intake interview, schedule half an hour more onto your time allotted. During it, ask for the client's input on their needs, call potential IRT members if you have the time with the client there right after the intake. Let them hear the client on speakerphone so they are motivated to participate in a meeting. When you do meet, express your common goals and sum up the plan to meet those goals. Then share, share, share the successes. Brian Ingram of WinTAC Technical Assistance Team is still providing biweekly input and instruction to one of our two regions, TC1, which is Jackson, Josephine, Douglas, and Klamath counties. Our region TC2 includes the Central Oregon counties of Crook, Jefferson and Deschutes counties, has been impacted by COVID related workload shift. So the counselor has had to address that by withdrawing. And Nikki Powis is still providing input and instruction for both of our Kentucky regions. Because of some of our state specific considerations, Kentucky is more near the beginning of IRT implementation. We are working on staffing cases with guidance from Nikki and are starting to coordinate service provisions with several people. The COVID has definitely set us back some and we're all learning how to communicate with people remotely, but we're hoping to get this off the ground and really have some success with it. Yes, folks, COVID has created layers of protection that might present uh, objections or barriers to meeting in person. However, there is some freedom in time, certainly, in not driving to meet face-to-face. -face. So if the client is the focus of the IRT's purpose, let that purpose inspire the virtual meetings and collaboration. This can still happen. Who thought a VRC might be recommending attending meetings? <laughs> a year ago, it would not have been I. However, selecting a few meetings to attend regularly to be well-informed for your client's benefit has become an invaluable source and resource to me. For example, because I attended the local leadership team headed by WorkSource Oregon, I was able to assist clients during the pandemic with unemployment insurance application and problem solving, as well as with pandemic unemployment assistance, which is retroactive. One client received a lump sum check for over $5,000, which has greatly aided him in having a financial buffer during this time. Unfortunately, the Chamber of Commerce meetings have been COVID casualties for my area of Southern Oregon. So I hope to renew that attendance in 2021. Lastly, peer mentoring is on an upswing in the form of virtual workshops, flash online job events, and feedback following those events by peer groups. The ESDs, Education Service Districts, are starting to refer transition-aged youth again, and we have connected them with all of the VR resources available, as well as have done virtual intakes. Adobe DocuSign has helped with getting VR paperwork signed and returned. And it's legal, a totally legal thing. Legal documents. Utilize youth and adult clients who have had successful VR outcomes to mentor new clients, youth to youth and adults to adults, toward their own success. Whenever possible, establish groups to provide support. 
OCB, that's Oregon Commission for the Blind, has a Thursday, 11 o'clock to noon, virtual social group, Zoom or phone in only option, and that's statewide now. So this allows clients to hear and discuss VR options and requirements in real time with their peers. Chamber meetings have also been a COVID casualty in Kentucky. One group that is consistently still meeting via Zoom are the Healthy Coalitions for each county. So we have and will continue that participation as much as possible. We want to continue to develop and nurture these relationships to truly increase the community knowledge of vocational rehab and the services we provide and to increase our counselors capacity and familiarity with the businesses and agencies around them. The University of Kentucky put together a bodacious transportation resource listing for Oregon. Here's the list so you can see an example of who's on there and what they do. Find out what these organizations do in depth and then proceed with discussion about what more is possible. You can't sell it or vouch for its reliability if you haven't used it yourself. This will build credibility. Transportation issues in rural communities have been an issue for a long time. Keep working at untying this bundle and you'll get there eventually. Some clients live outside the boundaries of municipal transit, buses, or even dial a ride or lift services. Some live so far out that a four mile trip on Uber or Lyft will cost them $15 each way, which is not sustainable. Even if they were working full time, the trips to and from home plus tips would cost them three of the eight hours they are working. I've negotiated with cab companies for reduced fares on regular customers. One client gets picked up at 4.40 a.m. to be at work by 5 a.m. and as an A&D counselor, and she is able to ride the bus to go home. So it's a $13 cab ride to work and a dollar bus ride home, which is sustainable for her at $22 an hour. For minimum wage workers, that's where Waze Carpool for multiple clients riding with one general VR client as a driver could work. Our targeted Community 1, Jackson, Josephine, Douglas, and Klamath Counties has been a pilot project for our agency, along with our TC2, the High Desert Region. We're working on development and integration of these items, and our leadership at the Commission for the Blind continues to support these activities and is hopeful to build all these programs into statewide client supports, and then we're gonna go global. We have integrated these priorities into the workflow of our counselors. Leadership will continue to encourage these activities of our counselors and build the programs into our regular client services. Thanks folks. Through this collaborative work with VR and community stakeholders, E3 partners then develop specific training and technical assistance activities to address the needs identified in the previous phases. These trainings and technical assistance were then offered to staffs of VR agencies, CBOs, and CRPs, and in some cases directly to the consumers themselves. Training and technical assistance activities covered four broad categories. One, trainings were offered in issues of specific concern to HLGNA populations in that targeted community. For example, HIV AIDS and mental health and substance abuse awareness activities. The second category focused on training to HLGNA specific issues that potentially impact service delivery. For example, understanding the intersection of disability and poverty and trauma-informed care were very well-received trainings. The third category focused on training and activities that encourage collaboration between community stakeholders and increase coordination of service strategies and potential system-wide change initiatives, such as introducing and implementing the integrated resource team model and learning to braid and leverage resources. Fourth, training and activities that encourage the expansion of employment opportunities for HLGNA population. 
activities in this category focused on employer engagement, business development, grant writing, and self-employment and home-based employment activities. Here's a non-exhaustive list of just some of Project E3 training and technical assistance activities. As you can see, some of the activities focused on providing training and services directly to members of the HLGNA community, such as mindfulness, stress reduction, financial literacy training, empowerment trainings, and job clubs. Other trainings were offered to the staff of VR and CBOs in order to increase rapport building to improve employment outcomes, such as motivational interviewing and trauma-informed care. Many of these trainings and more have been recorded as webinars and posted to the E3 website. In North Carolina, the focus group were transition age youth and adults of economically disadvantaged rural and remote communities who have mental impairment and blindness or visual impairments. Also, who receives SSI, so supplemental security income and other benefits. There were two targeted communities in North Carolina. One is Rocky Mountain Vocational Rehabilitation and Greensville Disability Services for the Blind. And the other one is Boone Vocational Rehabilitation, Asheville and Winston-Salem Disability Services for the Blind. Their sustainability plan focuses on training on motivational interviewing and they indicated they improved the counselor client relationship and communication. So they want to continue this uh, motivational interview in their activity. Then another is innovative strategy of job placement. So they're looking for how to place them in jobs in different areas of the state. Another area they focused on trauma informed care uh, in the organization they could implement this whole organization structure about the trauma informed care. That is the focus of North Carolina. Let's hear their vignettes. Project E3 North Carolina Overview and Sustainability Plan. Project E3 North Carolina targeted residents of rural or remote communities in two economically disadvantaged areas of the state. Region 1 includes our western mountain counties of Allegheny, Ash, Avery, Mitchell, Watauga, Wilkes, and Yancey. Region 2 includes the northeastern counties of Edgecombe, Halifax, Nash, and Northampton. Targeted populations were residents of targeted communities between the ages of 14 and 64 who are eligible for, have applied for, or are receiving SSI, SSDI, and or TANF, and are blind or visually impaired, or have one or more intellectual, developmental, or mental health disabilities. The core project partners are the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services and Division of Services for the Blind, and our stakeholder group included staff representing community rehabilitation programs, local workforce boards and NC Works career centers, and county departments of social services. Our first priority is motivational interviewing training, which uses evidence-based tools and techniques that were easily incorporated into daily practice. Participants reported that the motivational interviewing training improved communication and collaboration between counselor and client, help consumers discover their passion for a given career path, and increase their ability to take meaningful action towards goals. The second priority is innovative strategies for job placement training, which was rated as valuable by all participants regardless of position or experience in the job. The training series highlights the importance of a customer service trio approach that adds VR counselor to the dual customer equation the necessity of elevating business engagement as an organizational priority, not just a goal of business services staff, and the need for strategic research and planning to develop relevant, innovative strategies that meet the demands of employers. The third priority is developing a trauma-informed culture that recognizes the impact that traumatic experience may have on our health, work performance, and relationships 
and provides services in an environment that enhances feelings of safety and belonging, empowering both consumers and employees. North Carolina plans on sustaining Project E3 pri priorities by ensuring alignment with organizational values and strategic goals to maintain support from leadership, partnering with our professional development and training team to develop virtual Project E3 training modules and resource guides, and developing communications plan to promote training modules and resource guides. The plan for sustaining motivational interviewing training is in alignment with proactive communication, teamwork, and people-focused organizational goals. PD team, PDT team developed an intro to motivational interviewing module for DBRS and DSB staff, man our learning management system. And the planning session for ongoing motivational interviewing training has been scheduled for January of 2021. Plan for sustaining innovative strategies for job placement as by aligning with teamwork and people-focused organizational goals. It's an existing series of four one-hour Project E3 trainings that were provided virtually and will be loaded into our learning management system. We're planning to develop an innovative strategies for job placement resource guide and communications plan to promote the training to all staff. Sustaining trauma-informed culture, which is in alignment with people-focused, belonging, and joy at work organization goals. The PDT team is reviewing E3 materials and other resources to develop training around the importance of trauma-informed culture, and developing unit and district office environmental assessment to ensure a welcoming office environment for staff and consumers. Thank you. There are two targeted communities located in Louisiana, one in New Orleans, the largest city of Louisiana, and in Baton Rouge, that is the capital city. And the focus group here are African-American with HIV AIDS and African-American with mental health condition. So the Louisiana Rehabilitation Services, their sustainability include, sustainability plan include two major focus that how to expand employment opportunities in the state government. And they want to hire qualified personnel to enhance, enhance job placement outcome for people with disabilities. Now let's hear their plan. Hi, uh, my name is Madel Schexner Chapman and I am um, the regional manager for Louisiana Rehabilitation Services, the Baton Rouge office. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, going through my presentation for the Project E3 Leadership Academy um, 2 for Louisiana. Um, the first priority for the E3TC project was to increase community engagement, it was to increase community engagement opportunities with stakeholders. The Project E3 provided training for different agencies regarding HIV and mental health. The exchange of information empowered persons with challenges related to mental health in HIV and strengthen the VR services delivering. That was our priority number one. Our priority number two, increase LRS internal capacity to effective, effectively serve persons with mental health and HIV challenges through Rehabilitation Employment Development Specialists or our REDS. LRS is currently hiring these positions statewide to provide focused efforts to secure successful employment opportunities for individuals with unique challenges. Our third priority is to assist departments and agencies with, within Louisiana state government to become model employers for individuals with disabilities, inclusive of, all, of individuals with challenges related to mental health and HIV. LRS is an active participant on the state as a model employer, the same task force in accordance with the executive order JBE 1808. The purpose is to increase the representation of individuals with disabilities employed in Louisiana state government. Those were our three priorities um, as, a, as a way to state um, the sustainability, um, the steps that we were taking to ensure the sustainability of our efforts. 
efforts was to actively participate in forums to provide for effective exchanges of information with stakeholders like referrals, CRPs, coalitions, et cetera. Identify and provide training opportunities to the res related to employment strategies specific to persons with mental health challenges and HIV and to contribute to the development and identification of strategy resources in, part in partnership to assist state agencies with the recruitment, hiring, and retention of individuals with disabilities and employment. So those are some of the um, areas that we are we're taking efforts to sustain, uh, actually the, the things we're doing to sustain our efforts um, with, within the Project E3 and, and what we're doing. So that's, that's it. As we look at phase four of sustainability and systems change, Project D3 partners worked with lead staff at state VR agencies and their community partners to develop sustainability plans for each of the state project. The intent was to develop specific strategies to ensure that change efforts were maintained beyond the life of the five-year grant project. One of the strategies utilized by Project D3 was through the creation of the Leadership Academy, providing both in-person learning opportunities as well as remote opportunities. The Leadership Academy also included monthly community of practice meetings that invited key staff from each of the 12 projects throughout the country to participate in a community that would encourage additional learning. Each state agency that was associated with a project ultimately developed a sustainability plan. In addition, the Project E3 would also like to sustain some of the learning opportunities that were developed throughout the life of the project. So we wanna make folks aware that Project E3 website will maintain uh, until March 31st of 2021. And then beyond that, archived on the NCRTM website. Project E3 provided a number of universal technical assistance webinars, uh, over 40 webinars that have been archived, and a plethora of resources. In the New Mexico project, the targeted communities were Albuquerque and Deming. The HLGNA groups were persons with a primary disability of an anxiety disorder, depressive disorder, or personality disorder, and or other persons with a primary disability of alcohol abuse or drug dependence. In the New Mexico project, um, the key E3 influencers are looking to maintain the gains they have achieved through implementing the integrated resource team model. This model was implemented as a way to build partnerships and to leverage additional services in their communities for the benefit of their consumers. In addition, the New Mexico team is looking to implement the TRAILS model, which stands for Team Resources for Aligning of Integration and Leveraging of Services, as a model to create working committees between VR and core partners of the workforce development system to facilitate greater systems integration between those various state partners. And we're now going to play the vignette from New Mexico. Welcome, my name is John Walsh. I'm project manager for Project D3 and have the great pleasure to work with the folks in New Mexico on their intensive TA project. I have with me today, Reyes Gonzalez and Eric Padilla, uh, two of the leads in our project in New Mexico. Eric and Reyes, I'm gonna turn it over to you gentlemen. Hello, this is Reyes Gonzalez, field operation director for the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. I have 24 years experience working with the agency. I'm also uh, a workforce board member, and I represent the VR program with the Central Workforce Board. And um, I have two years working on the E3 project, and I've been there since the beginning. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Padilla, and I'm the program manager for Southwest New Mexico. I'm also on the Southwestern Area Workforce Board and a Disabilities Committee Chair. Priority number one, greater collaboration between partners in the workforce development system. We want to create and nurture a shared vision with our workforce partners, deepen and expand relationships with these partners, and explore new partnerships with community-based organizations. 
In Albuquerque, we work very closely with the central board workforce operator and the Casa de Phoenix program, which is a homeless program that serves those that are mentally ill and substance abuse and employment's part of that. So uh, through the C3 program, we've developed relationships with both these partners. And uh, in Deming, we're really trying to connect all the workforce partners. That's the main vision, to be able to have a smoother transition for participants and working together under the workforce system. Prior, priority number two, implementation of the integrated resource team model. New Mexico DVR uh, is working on this project both in Albuquerque and the Deming area. In Albuquerque, we're currently uh, conducting the IRT with Casa de Phoenix. Originally, uh, the pilot started off where we're gonna work with Title I and Title III partners in the workforce system. However, due to COVID, uh, we kind of put that on hold um, since they're really busy with uh, the unemployment situation in New Mexico, but we do plan to get these partners involved with Casa de Phoenix in the future. And in the, in the Deming area, uh, prior to that, the IRT was mainly for community resources, but right now we're wanting to get workforce partners involved in the IRT training and um, provide, um, BR staff will be providing a lot of that training as well. Priority number three, implementation of new projects and programs. In Albuquerque, and this is real recent, uh, there's a county grant that's for peer support uh, with the New Mexico Workforce Connection, and it's gonna be targeting mental health and substance abuse, which is in alignment with our Casa de Phoenix partner and their goals. Um, also, we developed a job club at Casa de Phoenix and uh, we are working with workforce to provide them assessments regarding work interests with our workforce system. And in the Deming area, we've been introduced to the trails model, which we hope to implement um, at the workforce system level and identify uh, various staff members within the workforce system to be able to uh, determine solutions, to be able to make services more efficient to participants. Now, in the Deming area, we have a, a community academy coming up that's going to be virtual, and this is going to be on November 20th. We're hoping to pull all resources within Southwest New Mexico to be able to get more familiar with their programs. And uh, we're also expanding on our partnership, again, with the workforce system in the uh, IRT model. In Albuquerque, we did conduct a community academy about a year ago. Um, and through the IRT process, we realized the need to develop an online referral system between DVR and the workforce. And this is something that we piloted. And now um, this project is gonna go into implementation with all other pro uh, partners in workforce. And then uh, again, the IRT model will be uh, lead staff within VR will be mentors in training the workforce staff on the IRT model. A lot of this has already been introduced. However, we would like to put more focus on the details of the IRT and that way we can implement it in the future. Very good. Well, gentlemen, thank you for giving an overview of the New Mexico project. Thank you, John. In Virginia, the targeted communities were Martinsville and the Henry County region, as well as the Hampton Roads region. The HLGNA groups included consumers with drug abuse or dependency who reside in economically disadvantaged rural or remote communities and persons with mental illness who also reside in those communities. You will see in the Virginia vignette that the presenters will talk about the support of their executive leadership at their agency at Virginia DARS. In addition, this support led to a support of a statewide implementation of core concepts of the system change initiative in that state. So the actual change efforts extended beyond the two targeted communities to encompass the agency looking at their entire culture and to incorporate key components of the Project E3 technical assistance as part of their state uh, project. 
Good afternoon. My name is David Leon. I'm the Deputy Director for Workforce Programs with the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services. And we're going to spend a few minutes to share what we are working on in the priorities for our targeted communities project. Our first priority for moving forward is a statewide introduction of what we've done in Martinsville and the Hampton Roads area. We have begun with what we called our E3 influencer group. That consisted of two staff per office from each district across the state. And within those groups were district directors, VR office managers, counselors, placement staff, and assistant staff. These individuals had six two-hour interactive sec sessions that included follow-up work, preparatory work, a little bit of homework. And during this process, we talked about the intersection of disability and poverty, partnership development and collaboration through community academies, and the integrated resource team model and financial empowerment. We really wanted to focus on what worked in both of the original communities and develop a framework for moving forward in other parts of the state. Those staff that participated represented more than half of our additional offices. And we have a follow-up session scheduled just to make sure there are no more questions and for next steps where we begin to invite our partner agencies. Our second priority was the integration of financial empowerment into the VR service delivery system. And we did that in a bunch of ways and we'll continue to do so. While the project was going on, uh, the two areas participated in Bridges Out of Poverty, uh, trainings on the intersection of disability and poverty, significant emphasis on social security work incentives and the Medicaid expansion. And we did a lot of work around financial empowerment and behavioral economics. When it came to the influencers, we made sure that two of the sessions they had were the intersection of disability and poverty and that community financial empowerment. That's a program where we're looking at working with people in poverty as a cultural competency and shifting to think about uh, how we can utilize the skills of counselors in terms of counseling and guidance to help our clients understand behaviors that may uh, affect jobs and create um, ways to be more um, fiscally responsive. We also have put an a program into place that we are using from the cities for financial empowerment. We have had um, two cohorts and are about to have our third and final cohort of staff go through their training for uh, financial coaching. It is approximately 40 hours of financial counselor training. And this is what's used across the country in the cities for financial empowerment program. Our third priority has been to continue with community capacity building. And we have focused on growing the Centers for Independent Living around the state. Uh, we worked closely with the state level leadership for the SILs and partnered around expanding the capacity of SILs to provide financial empowerment services for VR consumers with the potential for increased fee for service opportunities. Another reason we wanted to focus on the SILs was this is a great opportunity to increase potential referrals, both to SILs um, from VR, but also hoping that VR will receive more referrals from the SILs. Uh, through this program, we hope to see SILs choose to be uh, VITA sites when tax season comes. The two SILs um, in the targeted communities receive customized training on financial empowerment strategies that were designed to support those staff in engaging and serving underserved and economically disadvantaged persons with disabilities. Each area had a um, six two-hour sessions that included both preparation and follow-up activities for those targeted communities. And in each area prior to those trainings and sessions, there was time spent creating a resource map of where those SILs could fill gaps related to financial empowerment for people with disabilities. We're very excited about that. And in terms of sustainability, I think we're doing a lot already and had had that as part of our model from the beginning. It has been very helpful that our commissioner and our division director are 100% on board and in support of this project. We have uh, 
a video that will be developed through a partnership with ERI and Wisconsin to introduce the project for new counselors in the future. Um, we plan to use it with trainings and it will include um, lessons learned and best practices from each of the two targeted areas. There will be another section of the video that includes um, our leadership talking about their vision for where we go from here. We are continuing to um, integrate financial empowerment into the VR service delivery system. We are doing that through um, a couple of fee for service tools we've created, including a financial health assessment specific to our clients. I am pleased to say that we are beginning to get referrals for that service. We're also focused on community capacity building with not only those two SILs, but in doing the work with those SILs, we are working to help those SILs share this information in other areas of, of the state as well. And another area I'm really excited about is that we have developed an MOU with, with um, the city of Roanoke for their city for financial empowerment project just in the last two months. That project provides free financial coaching uh, around things like debt reduction, credit building, asset development, budgeting. We have already referred over 25 of our clients from that local office to the project and a similar project, which is a year behind us starting up in, in the Richmond area. So we are looking to these partners to grow the work we are doing. And again, Braden leverage resources that our agency can't provide directly, but by keeping them in the front of our minds when we're working with clients, making sure that we don't skip anything or miss an opportunity to provide a more holistic experience for each of our uh, clients. And those are some of the things we're doing here in Virginia. Thank you very much. In addition to intensive technical assistance, Project E3 also provided targeted technical assistance to requesting agencies. One example comes from Wisconsin DVR. Their statewide needs assessment uncovered additional barriers to service provision for consumers of color living in segregated and disadvantaged communities in Milwaukee. These barriers were preventing these consumers from full participation in training and employment. Wisconsin DVR requested technical assistance from Project D3 partners to further investigate in order to develop solutions aimed at reducing or removing these barriers. Project D3 partners assisted Wisconsin DVR in designing community discussion groups and training facilitators to lead these groups. They also assisted with collecting and analyzing the data obtained from the focus groups discussions and summarizing the data, developing the final report and identifying the next steps. The final report was recently completed and is currently available on the Project D3 website. Wisconsin DVR has now begun the process of implementing some of their findings, and we hope to be able to share more with you about that in Project D3's final report. Speaking of websites, the Project D3 website has been the repository of all of Project D3's universal technical assistance activities and products. This includes all of the Project D3 webinars produced by the team at SVRI. There are also several communities of practice hosted on this site and a variety of reports and other tools that Dr. Kundu will touch upon in a few minutes. The Project D3 website will be available until March 2021. After that, the website will be archived to NCRTM so that the information, tools, and lessons learned will be available long after the project has ended. Now let me tell you about some of the resources of the Project E3 that you can take advantage of it. Uh, the first one is targeted community profiles. It describes the targeted communities and their priority population in each state, including area of unemployment and poverty indicators, population characteristics, and strategies to address barriers with contact information for each community's E3 partner. Webcasts, it includes about 40 archived webinars on evidence-based practices, promising practices, and emerging practices that are effective when working with are underserved or unserved targeted populations, free of charge. CRC continuing education credits are available for each webinar. 
new webinars being produced and added to the site, please register for one of our webinars today. Next area is resource library. It allows you to search the project website by keyword, population served, and community strategy to help link field to relevant resources and readings. New contacts is being added regularly. Research summaries, at a glance, plain language research summaries to link busy professionals in the field with academic research into evidence-based practice. A clear understanding of research in the area by topic, quick reads with information that can be applied to daily practice. Another area is called resource roundup. It provides up-to-date information on various topics, including links to our counselor toolkit, COVID-19 resources, and related topics. Strategies to address barriers. It includes information on evidence-based practices, such as job club, financial literacy, uh, training, motivational interviewing, customized employment, and more. Organized by strategy, it can be used to apply a technique to daily practices. Uh, the last one is community. To sign up for our online communities of practice where professionals meet to share ideas, discuss strategies, and evidence-based practice application, including communities on rural and remote services, disability and poverty, career development and employment research, and social security benefits and employment. Please join today and share your expertise and learn from others. So in closing, what we achieved in this project, we have a cadre of knowledge developed by E3 that will be helpful all VR agencies in the country, community rehab programs, community-based organization to access and implement in providing quality services leading to enhanced employment outcomes for economically disadvantaged people with disabilities. We provided the E3 website, projecte3.com, and E3 archived webinars and the previous slides. Sustainability plan developed by the state VR agencies indicating their comments and collaborations. Collaboration among state VR agencies and their partners have increased tremendously and leading to increased referrals, increased application, increased eligibility of VR services, and increased job placement. So video vignettes affirm that Project E3 has made an enormous impact in the rehabilitation community successfully achieved his objectives and vision of Dr. Alodata. To access additional information on results of Project E3, please view our results and reflections webinar at httpsncrtm.gov slash rsa virtual series. And also visit our project e3.com for in July, 2021, for the final report of the project. So you'll have all of this outcome in that report. Well, if you need more information, please contact um, uh, myself, Dr. Madan Kundu, project director, your phone number and email address. Similarly, Dr. Susan Flower Benton, our principal investigator, our telephone number and um, email address. And please communicate with us uh, if it can be assistance to you in any way possible. Thank you for joining with us today.